Good evening, everyone, and welcome back to the Suburban Rifleman. Uh, right away, I would like to apologize for the rather dark indoor video uh, this evening. It was my intention to make uh, several shooting videos over at the gun club tonight, but I forgot once again that it was uh, Thursday evening, and Thursday evening is trap shooting night at the club. So um, the uh, range is occupied, and I really want to get this video made. I made an interesting discovery about this rifle a couple of months ago, and I've been really anxious to get this video made, and I generally just don't have time. Vacation is a great time for me to make videos, and tonight is my last night of vacation. Tomorrow morning we are leaving and driving home to Pennsylvania. I'll be in the car for 10 hours, and then it's back to the grind and back to dealing with all kinds of things that have happened while I was gone. So we're going to make this video come hell or high water. Um, I think you can see the rifle fairly well. Um, if I was at the range, I would have shot for accuracy. Um, I would have even shot this outdoors, except it started raining when I decided to make the video, so I'm stuck indoors. Um, and we can't go to the club, but at the end of this video, if you want to see this rifle in action, I'm going to go out onto the porch, and I'm just going to take maybe three shots back into the woods, uh, into the bank. I'm not shooting for accuracy, just so you can see the rifle in action. So. Let's get started. Um, I know most of you are familiar with the Craig Jorgensen rifle, and most of you are sitting there and going, that's a Craig Jorgensen rifle. There are still more of you uh, who have read the title of this video, who are familiar with the work of R.F. Sedgley, um, and you're looking at this rifle and going, that's not a Sedgley Craig, except it is a Sedgley Craig, and I can prove it. And I will hopefully convince you of that fact as soon as I show you the evidence that I have. Um, but I didn't think this was a Sedgley Crag either. Um, I bought this rifle. It's been around for maybe 25, 30 years. Um, it was in my possession for a while. I bought it at a farm auction out of a barn. Uh, I went to this auction. There were a couple of dusty old rifles in a barn, one of which was a completely unmessed with 1905 Ross uh, had all of the little bits and pieces that usually get lost off of it. And I was bidding against the Ross collector on that one. And that one went um, not super high by today's standards, but it went close to $200. And I was like, eh, I don't really want to Ross that bad. So I let it go. We were the only two that were bidding. Um, then the crag came up and I started bidding on it. And I outbid the guy this time, and I paid $250 for this thing, which today seems like a bargain. At the time, I went home and my dad was like, are you insane? Why would you pay $250 for this old piece of crap? Um, it's obviously converted. It's not an original military crag. And um, it's definitely not worth $250. I would say it was a pretty good investment at this point. Uh, I think if I wanted to sell it, I could certainly get my money back today. But at the time, it seemed a little insane. And when I bought this, I didn't really know an awful lot about crags. I just saw this thing, and I knew that crags were cool, and I wanted it, and I had money burning a hole in my pocket, and I bought it. And um, as soon as I got it, the guy who had been bidding against me, who also bought the Ross, said, you paid too much for that rifle. And I'm like, well, I only paid $5 more than you were willing to pay for it. And he said, well, I really wanted the rear sight. Um, the rest of the rifle's been converted. It's a Bannerman's chop up. And, you know, it's really not worth, you know, what you paid for it. But uh, speaking of the rear sight, it's rather an interesting thing right off the bat. Um, if you were a mechanical engineering student and you were interested in firearms design and you were doing your internship at uh, uh, Springfield Armory, for instance, you could probably write a master's thesis or a doctoral dissertation on Craig Jorgensen rear sights. Um, I believe there were five variations in, uh, in all in le just a little bit 
more than or a little bit less than 10 years of service, nine years of service, 11 years of service, something like that, five different rear sights. And not just minor little variations, uh, complete departures at times. But uh, this is the third variation. I think it's the 1901 uh, sight. This is based on a Model 1898 Krag. I believe this one was made in 1901 or 1902. Um, the stock cartouche is intact and it says 1902, uh, but for some reason I think this serial number puts it at 1901. This may not be the correct stock, but it is a nice stock. Um, so after the adoption of the 03 Springfield, there were tons and tons of crags in inventory. Um, they're beautifully manufactured rifles. For the most part, they were not very heavily used. I mean, a few of them uh, got used in the Spanish-American War down in Cuba and later on in the Philippine insurrection. And um, so they had seen a little bit of combat and I think there was a, a little bit of use in a couple of other little Banana Republic conflicts uh, during the early 20th century. But for the most part, most of these rifles were in really great condition. And most of them ended up going to big surplus outfits like Bannerman's or Stokes Kirk was another one in Philadelphia. Um, some of the rifles were sold off as is uh, for very cheap prices. Um, and of course, the most desirable thing to have today would be an unconverted uh, Craig Jorgensen rifle. But of course, in 1920 or whenever this was being done, there really weren't a lot of military collectors. People were mostly buying rifles because they were interested in hunting and they wanted a cheap hunting rifle. And so a lot of these outfits, like Bannerman's, like Stokes Kirk, um, did quick and dirty conversions of these rifles to more or less carbine configuration. The carbines were much more popular because they were lightweight and fast handling. And you could take a full-length infantry rifle, which had a very long barrel, I don't remember, 26 or 27 inches, something like that. You'd chop a bunch off of the barrel, shorten the stock to carbine configuration, fit a new front sight, and you could actually mark up the rifle and sell it for more than if it hadn't been converted at all. Um, so these conversions were quite popular with buyers. Um, they were still very cheap, but um, uh, that you could definitely sell them for a little bit more. And this usually involved, as I said, cutting off the stock, cutting the barrel, fitting a new front sight. Uh, in the case of Bannerman's and Stokes Kirk, it was oftentimes an 03 Springfield front sight, as you see on this rifle. Um, and that was pretty much it. And then they would sell you a bunch of cheap surplus ammo, and boom, you're ready to go deer hunting. Um, there were other conversions that were done uh, by a U.S. government arsenal in California. The name escapes me. It's, I, I don't have it right off the top of my head. Um, but those were done you know, by the U.S. government, converted from rifles to carbine length. They were done by U.S. Army uh, armorers, and that work was really first class. And they were converted uh, more or less completely to crag carbine configuration, including the installation of a crag carbine type front sight. Um, and those were sold off through the NRA uh, and the precursor to the CMP, which was called the DCM, the Director of Civilian Marksmanship, uh, to NRA members and gun club members as target shooting rifles. And those are actually quite desirable today, whereas the the Bannermans and the Stokes Kirk are, I mean, any Craig is worth money today, but uh, those low end conversions that were kind of, sometimes the work was okay, sometimes it was sort of slipshod, um, those are worth much, much less money. And I knew that this wasn't an NRA car being when I bought it. Uh, well, shortly after I bought it, I had no idea what it was when I bought it. Uh, shortly afterwards, I determined that it was not a, uh, an NRA carbine because it had an 03 Springfield front sight and because the, uh, I think those were fit into actual carbine stocks. This is definitely a cut-down rifle stock 
And so I operated under the assumption for many years that this was a Bannerman's or a Stokes Kirk cheapo conversion. And to be sure, it's it's pretty basic conversion of a Krag rifle. But there were other sort of semi-custom rifle makers that were doing really nice conversions of military rifles. Um, one of which, of course, was Griffin and Howe. Everybody knows about them. They were converting, I think, Mauser rifles, O3 Springfields, Crags, maybe some other military rifles, and making really beautiful, uh, professional looking and, and performing uh, sporting rifles out of military rifle actions. A very extensive work, lots and lots of handwork, really beautifully executed. Um, that was uh, Griffin and Howe, but there was another maker called R.F. Sedgley, who was located in Philadelphia. And R.F. Sedgley didn't have quite the reputation of Griffin and Howe. R.F. Sedgley rifles don't command the same kind of prices as Griffin and Howe. But R.F. Sedgley did some really, really beautiful work. They had some very talented gunsmiths working for them. Um, and they made some really high-end conversions and sort of mid-grade conversions. And I've read a few articles about R.F. Sedgley over the years. And I always thought, wouldn't it be great to have a Sedgley Springfield or a Sedgley Craig? Because uh, I don't think I'll ever own a Griffin and Howe. Those go for too much money. But I always thought, eh, Sedgley would be cool. And little did I know that for years and years and years, I had a Sedgley Craig. Because I didn't know that Sedgley also did some very basic conversions as uh, were done by Bannermans or Stokes Kirk, uh, but done with a little bit more care. Uh, you know, when, when R.F. Sedgley would do the work, they would make sure that the front sight was installed correctly, and the stock work was done a little bit more nicely, and the crown on the barrel was done with some care. And R.F. Sedgley actually went so far as to proof test all of their rifles, which is something the Bannermans and Stokes Kirk certainly were not doing. Uh, I'm not even sure if Griffin and Howe uh, had their own proofing system, but Sedgley did. And to be sure, it was a, from what I've read, it was a fairly basic uh, system. They would strap the rifle down to a table in their proof room and throw an old steer hide on top of the rifle uh, load it with a, uh, a proof round and fire it with a string. And if the rifle didn't explode, um, they would put their proof mark on it. And if it did explode, well, hopefully that steer hide would uh, keep everybody from getting killed by shrapnel. Um, this one apparently did uh, pass the proof testing. And it's the proof mark that Sedgley installed that let me know that this was, in fact, a Sedgley Craig. I recently got this rifle back. Um, as I said, I bought it 25 years ago. Um, my dad took mercy on me and bought it from me or traded something uh, to me for it. My dad was a fairly extensive uh, U.S. military uh, rifle collector. He had it in his collection for a while. And I recently got it back maybe two years ago. And... It, was, it still had a lot of grunge and grime. I had never really uh, detail cleaned it. Some of the things like the mag, magazine cutoff was really gritty and the, the safety was kind of gritty. And I thought, you know what? I'm going to really take this rifle apart, really clean it nicely, um, rub some uh, raw linseed oil into the stock, you know, maybe put some butcher's wax here and there. And while I was doing that, while I was taking the rifle apart, I removed the rear sight, and when I lifted the rear sight leaf up, I looked onto the barrel in this little cutout here between the rear sight and the, the uh, end of the opening in the handguard, and there's a small S in a circle. And I said, I'm not familiar with that mark at all. So I went to my books. I have books of, of military proof marks. And I could not find an S anywhere. And I didn't figure it was from Bannerman's. I thought, S, Stokes Kirk maybe? Maybe Stokes Kirk marked their rifles because there's no other markings on the thing. 
Nope, Stokes Kirk. And I thought, well, somebody had to proof mark this thing with an S. And I started searching around, and after about an hour or two on the internet, looking for a circle S proof mark, RF Sedgley popped up, and I went, this thing's a Sedgley crag? And sure enough, I, it has to be. I, I don't have any other explanation. I'm not saying that there aren't people out there who could make a fake Sedgley proof stamp uh, to put on a rifle, um, but I don't know why you would do that. And I certainly don't know why somebody would have done it many, many years ago when a rifle like this really wouldn't have been worth much of anything even with a bit of Sedgley provenance. I mean, I'm not operating on the, under any illusions that this rifle is suddenly much more valuable um, because it's a Sedgley than it would be if it was a Bannerman's or something. Um, but I can't imagine somebody faking this proof mark and putting it on a Bannerman's crag and then uh, leaving it in a barn uh, in a farm outside of Philadelphia to collect dust for 50 years uh, to sell it to some dope at an auction, a farm auction. So, as far as I can tell, this is a Sedgley crag. Certainly not up to the standards of some of the other stuff that Sedgley did, um, but in doing some research, this was definitely a thing. They did some very, very basic uh, conversions. There are a couple of things, if you were wanting to look for one of these, and I don't know if you're going to find many, but um, there are a couple of things about this that are distinctly different um, from the work that uh, Bannerman's did or Stokes Kirk did. Um, the most noticeable thing is the uh, forestock of the rifle. Um, all of these were shortened to something like carbine length. The barrel was uh, shortened to carbine length. It's 22 inches, I believe. And that's the same length as the cavalry carbine versions of the Krag. Um, most of these rifles had the forestock shortened back to just in front of the barrel band, which is what a military carbine would have looked like. Um, apparently, Sedgley thought, well, we'll just go to this midpoint between the front sight and the, the uh, barrel band. And to my eye, actually, when I look at photographs of... Um, Bannerman's conversions or even actual U.S. military crag carbines, this actually looks a lot more balanced to me. This looks more like a sporting rifle. Um, I know it's a small thing. It's still just cut off and rounded on the end, but I actually think that's a bit more elegant looking uh, than the carbine stock that, uh, well, the actual carbine stock or the one that Bannerman's and Stokes Kirk were trying to emulate in, uh, in their conversions. And that's probably the most noticeable difference. I think there were a couple of other things and uh, they're slipping my mind at the moment. So unfortunately, uh, I wanted to shoot this at the club and uh, we're not gonna be able to do that, but I am gonna go out here on the porch. It is still raining a little bit, but I'm just gonna shoot about three rounds off the back porch just so you can see it in action. This is not any type of accuracy test. I'm not even going to be shooting at anything. I'm just going to be shooting into the sandbank out back here in front of the woods. But if there is interest in seeing uh, a proper shooting video of this crag, uh, shooting off a bench, testing the accuracy, seeing what it's capable of, I will be more than happy to produce that as well in the future. Um, I don't see any need to do a wrap-up. Uh, when I post this video and any future videos, I hope to see each of you here then. Later, guys, and uh, stay tuned because I am going to take a few shots with this. Okay, so once again, this is just for fun. Um, I don't have any really new ammo. I've got this ancient box of Winchester silver tips that are probably from like the 1930s or 1940s. I'm not shooting those. There is a handful of uh, much more recent hand loads in here, uh, but they're not super recent. So, but anyway, we're not shooting for accuracy. We're just going to shoot this for fun, just so you guys can see the rifle in action. I'll take three shots. We are at the house. My dog is inside, so if she starts losing her mind and barking, you'll know what that is.
I don't know what that proved, but you got to see it shoot. 